Good evening. This is the next to the last of our uh, ca archaeology cafes here at uh, Changing Hands Bookstore. And Aaron will be talking uh, for half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity to ask questions and have an uh, interchange. So Aaron Wright um, has <clears throat> spent a lot of time in the Phoenix area. He did his dissertation work uh, with a focus on the South Mountain area, the rock art, and putting the, the rock art of that area into the context of its trails and artifacts, and uh, as well as the uh, rock art images. And he's kind of, I think, been bitten by uh, an interest in this lower Gila area. And tonight we'll be talking <coughs> about that area west of Phoenix, a focus on uh, the cultural uh, identity, which, which is referred to as Patayan, and I'll let Aaron uh, take it from here. He's, he is an Archaeology Southwest employee. I want to underscore that, too. So, Aaron, the show is yours. Wow, this is great. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? So um, it's great to be here and see familiar faces, a lot of people I recognize and other folks that are uh, new. So um, Bill introduced me very effectively. I've been working on the Lower Gila River for about four years now, and I want to share with folks some of the things that we're learning about the area. But before I get into what we're finding archaeologically, I really want to look at this concept of Patayan. And so it's a really fairly new concept to me, and I'll explain why. So this Patayan is an archaeological construct. It's something archaeologists refer to in terms of a pattern of material culture. And the way we draw the map around Patayan today, as you can see in this illustration, is pretty much the western third of the state of Arizona. So it covers a large area with a lot of environmental and topographic variation. And the material culture that we associate with Patayan can really be broken into three broad classes that really ties this pattern together for archaeologists. We've got the distribution of two types of pottery or pottery wares. On the top we have what archaeologists refer to as lower Colorado buff ware, so the buff firing uh, ceramic technology. On the bottom is Tizon brown ware, which is a brown firing ceramic technology. And generally, the lower Colorado buffware is found along sites in riverine contexts because of the clays are needed to be riverine to fire buff. And the brown is found in the higher elevations in the mountains. And those residual clays up there tend to fire brown or reddish brown. We also have petroglyphs. And there are distinctive styles of petroglyphs that are, fall within the Pataian sphere. And so at the top, for example, here I've got the Grape, Grapevine Canyon style. And it's centered around Grapevine Canyon near Needles um, at the mouth of Abiquame, which is the, um, basically the high mountain, the spiritual mountain for many of the Colorado River tribes. And then at bottom, we have uh, the Sears Point petroglyph style. So that's actually localized along the lower Gila River between approximately the Painted Rock Mountains and Agua Caliente. And then at right, we have geoglyphs. Uh, at top are the intaglio version, which is more common along the Colorado River. And at bottom are the rock alignments uh, types that we find predominantly along the lower Gila River. But as geoglyphs, if you look at the distribution of them, they're really confined to this region that we lump as Patayan. But what is Patayan? And so I was at the, uh, the SAA's, the Society for American Archaeology Conference last year, and one of my graduate professors from a while ago came up to me and said, what is this Patayan thing? And I said, well, it's this cultural pattern out west. I started talking archaeologically. And he's like, no, but what does it really, you know, what are these, what is this socially and what is it meaningfully? And so that's a great question because I've had several uh, graduate seminars in Southwest archaeology and we never covered it. And so I, I went to my textbooks. I've got five of the most recent popular textbooks on southwestern archaeology, and I looked in them, was, what, is, what is being taught about Patayan, if anything? And what we have here is a spectrum of general readership to more academic, and when it comes down, only two of these books actually have anything to do about, have anything to say about Patayan. And these books are actually the oldest of the five. These are over 20 years old. And so 
Well, we're not being taught this in our curriculum as graduate students, as Southwestern archaeologists. But we hear about it here and there tangentially. Oh, this Pataian thing out west, this Pataian thing on the lower Gila River. So I wanted to really deconstruct this concept of Pataian. Um, that's something that Bill Leip taught me as a when I was a graduate student, is to you really want to understand these concepts, you have to get at the root and expose them and, and see where we are today with these concepts. And so Pataian really starts in 1930 with the, the Pila Pueblo uh, Foundation and the surveys that they were conducting, and they were searching for the western range of the Red on Buff culture, which we understand today as Hoakam. And so the Pecos classification in 1927 laid out Southwest culture history through a Puebloan framework. And the Gila Pueblo was interested in seeing how that applied to Southern Arizona and other regions. And they did amazing work. They did big data before big data. So they surveyed pretty much the entire Southern Southwest. They went into Texas, Utah, California, et cetera. And they published this map in that 1930 volume. And most of that work in the Western part of Arizona was actually done by Frank Midvale, who is a predominant, a prominent Hoakam avocational archeologist who did a lot of the map bidding. So his name might be familiar to a lot of people in this room. His early career, he worked for Gila Pueblo and he surveyed all the sites in Western Arizona. And so Glablin, he was an anthropologist, not by training per se, he kind of fell into it. But anthropology at the time was really looking at things from multiple dimensions, archeology, span linguistics, and other factors. And Glablin was really influenced by linguistics. And so this concept of Pataian came out of his survey. And if I go back to this slide, you'll see, note all the brown circles in the west, the left side of the map and the north, northwest side of the map. He called that human. And the reason being is if you look at this map, this is the distribution of, uh, of tribes at, in 1848 uh, when this area became part of the United States. And I'll simplify it. If we look at the linguistic distribution, uh, the, the blue being human-speaking tribes and the red being Tepimon or Autumn in this part of the world, look how that compares to the distribution of the ceramics. So the brown pretty much maps onto the blue. The blue being distribution of human language. And Gladwin's methodology was working with tribes today, the linguistic com communities, so uh, Autumn, Yuman, and what he called Caduan, uh, and looking at the archaeology in those areas and projecting backwards. And so that's how we ended up with this concept of human and what Gladwin called a human root. And this is how he mapped it. What's interesting here is notice he doesn't map the human route as including the lower Gila River or the, Col the southern Colorado River, even though he surveyed in those areas. He's not alive today, I can't ask him. But he restricted it to this, this part of the state and it has created a lot of confusion ever since. But what I like and what I think is really important is he included it. Gladwin was a big thinker, a big picture kind of guy. He added it to uh, the culture roots of the Southwest, the four major culture roots is what he called them, using this Linnaean taxonomical system that I'll talk about in a second. But basket maker, we understand as Puebloan, Hohokam has not changed. Caduan, we now refer to as Mogollon. So Caduan is a language group. So again, Gladwin was using the language group of that region to describe the archeology. span now our next person came along, another Harry. This would be not Harry Gladwin, but Harry Colton. And he had problems with this concept of a human archeology span and, and the fact that the contemporary peoples can be equated with the prehistoric peoples in that region. And so he, he didn't have much qualm with Gladwin's work other than the name. And so he changed it to Patayan or Patayan. Uh, and he broke it into three branches. So here's this Linnaean classification scheme into effect. You've got a human root, or how we have a Pataian root, and it goes into these different branches. And we have these things called Prescott and Serba and Koonina. So it starts to get kind of confusing and crazy, so buckle up as we go down this road here. Uh, about the same time these folks were working, this gentleman named Malcolm Rogers was coming at this from the other side. He was from, working from California eastward. And he had some issues with the concept of Pataian, and he was working, for, uh, well, focused largely on the Colorado River, and so he referred to the word human stock. So he's, he's advocating for 
human as an archaeological concept. And he brings up the word stock, so he's also focused on linguistics. And he divided the river into upriver humans and downriver humans as two different groups, and he based that on their social relationships with their neighbors. And it's, you know, it's complicated, but uh, pretty simple nonetheless. And so there's this back and forth in the, in the ac academic literature amongst these folks. Uh, Colton was not an adversary of, of Rogers, and so he liked what Colton or what uh, Rogers was doing. So he adopted the downriver human, and, but he didn't call it human, and he, uh, he referred to it as lackish as a stem. So now we have a Ptian root with a lackish, uh, I'm sorry, a lackish branch and a Serbot branch. And he also took the Prescott, Koanina, and Sanawa and separated it and said those were no longer Batayan. They were their own unique cultural units. So I'm trying to expose here is how archaeologists think about these really big, complex patterns. Of course, Rogers comes back and says, no, these we're dealing with humans, and you're dealing with Batayan. So Batayan and human are not the same thing. Batayan is an upland cultural phenomenon. Uh, human is a river phenomenon. And in this paper in 1945, Malcolm Rogers laid out his grand vision of what he believed was human prehistory. And it started in 850 AD, and people migrated to the Colorado River from some desert in California. They moved down river over time. Then Lake Coila filled in around 1,000. Then people left the Colorado River Basin. They moved west, so you had a west focus at that time. They also moved uh, north of of the Lake Coia into the California desert focus. And then as the, that lake dried up, they moved back to the Colorado River, and there was too many people, and so they continued to move upstream to, uh, to over time, ending up in the Phoenix area where they are today. So very convoluted migration path that he mapped out through ceramics. Um, and this is an example of his ceramic typology that all of this is based on. Now, pivotal to his argument about the migrations was this archaeological site near Gila Bend. What I think is really interesting that the, his argument about human or Patayan prehistory is heavily influenced by this site and a number of other sites that aren't Patayan or human. This is a Hohokam site uh, dated to the eight, late 1200s. But his argument was that because you have these fortified sites that pop up in the West Phoenix area, around 1250, 1300, that these folks must be concerned about someone on that side of their world. And so uh, clearly the humans had, could not have penetrated by that point in time because these folks were defending against the warlike humans, which was based off this um, historical concept of human warfare. And our last figure that comes into the field and really makes it crazy is this guy, Al Schroeder. And Al Schroeder was a big picture kind of guy. He did a lot of work in the Southwest. He's trained in the Phoenix area here. And he did a short but extensive survey of the Colorado River for the Park Service. And he came up the Gila River at that time. He really changed it all up. And he introduced this concept of a Hakataya. And he calls it a culture, he calls it a tradition, he calls it a root. So it's this all-inclusive thing that covers pretty much all of Arizona almost. And part of that, now we have Patayan as a stem. It's no longer a root, it's a stem, and it has branches on its tree, and Lackish is something different. So here we still have the distinguish, this distinguishing element of Patayan and Lackish, or the river and the up, upland human-speaking communities. Now I won't go down the road, but he also lumped in Ho Kam into this Hakataya thing, and, Salado and a number of other things. But we could do a whole other thing on that. So in a recap, in a nutshell, we've got a very complicated picture where Patayan is a root and it's a stem. And we have branches and we have other stems and other roots. So it's, what I'm getting at here is there is no consensus on what is and is not Patayan. What's generally accepted is that it's, it's stretched across the whole extent of the historic distribution of where the human-speaking tribes were in 1848. So that causes a lot of issues when we're talking about Patayan or ancestral human speakers archaeologically. And so we don't have a consensus on what that means. Now let's start talking about the Lower Gila River. Now in Schroeder's vernacular, this would be a lackish thing, archaeological pattern 
and not a Pataian one. But generally, archaeologists today associate the human speaking or the Pataian component of this area as Pataian. That's how we re currently refer to it. And I got exposed to this, as I mentioned, about four years ago when I started working on this great Bend of the Gila National Monument effort. And one of the great things about this region that we think is worthy of preservation and recognition is really this fusion of Hohokam and Pataian. And some of the best preserved sites that remain in southwest Arizona are located along this lower stretch of the Gila River. And for those of folks that have volunteered with me in the field, um, I'm sure they can back me up on that. Now, this area is renowned for its archaeology, predominantly its petroglyphs. So we have the Sears Point Archaeological District, which was fully inventoried by Evelyn Billow and Bob Mark, who are here today. Thank you for showing up. Uh, marvelous site, stretched over several miles, over 10,000 petroglyphs in that area. Uh, we also have the Painted Rock Petroglyph site out there I've worked at, and uh, there's a photograph by my good friend Paul Vanderveen here. And uh, Painted Rock is a great site, it's marvelous. Now, I'm showing these two sites because they are considered National Historic Properties. They are on the register. So these are just two examples of the many properties along the lower Gila River that are uh, world-renowned, I think is an appropriate word. But what about the people that made those petroglyphs? So when I started working out in this area, I was drawn to the petroglyphs. That's my research background. But as Bill was mentioning, I really like to understand petroglyphs in a social context. So who was making them? Where are the people in this? Uh, the images are, are beautiful, but there had to be people that made them. And if we have sites that have 10,000, 5,000 petroglyphs here and there scattered along the lower Gila River, there's got to be people out there making the petroglyphs. But I've not read very much literature on the people. And the archaeological surveys that have gone on out there are really old. So there have not been any comprehensive surveys in that region since the 1960s. So if we dig deep, um, we don't find much, essentially, is what I'm getting at from, from an archaeological perspective. And so this concept of where are the people out there? And so I start talking with people, OK, this Pataian concept, what is it? Well, I've been told and I've read that Pataian is a mobile culture, right? So these folks were hunter-gatherers that came in, and eventually they settled with Hohokam farmers and then later Aatam farmers in the historic period. And so these are the three excerpts of recent articles, academic articles that I've selectively drawn from. Seasonal settlements, mobile Pataian foragers, and then this comparison with Hohokam. And so these are, all these are written by Hohokam archaeologists, and they're talking in the concept, in the context of when Pataian communities were co-residing with Hohokam. So there seems to be a bias, perhaps, or maybe a lack of understanding that Pataian covers a lot of stuff. It's not necessarily all mobile hunter-gatherers. It seems to have fallen through the floorboards. And so I looked at the, the human-speaking tribes at contact in the historic period. So let's look at how the human-speaking tribes organized their settlement and subsistence practices. And I've, these are all the historically documented, ethnographically uh, human-speaking tribes. And they cover the spectrum. We have mobile hunters and gatherers, of course, uh, predominantly in the uplands and the mountain areas away from the rivers. But along the rivers, we actually have sedentary agriculturalists. And that's not my word. That's Alfred Krober's word. That's the old ethnographers that study these people, Castetter and Bell. And so this, I'm not making this up. Mojave, Quetzan, Kiwana, Pipash, and Alchidome are sedentary agriculturalists historically. They were never mobile hunter-gatherer peoples. These were the people living along the rivers at contact and are still living along the rivers to this day. And so they had a, they were agriculturalists. They farmed. Castor and Bell estimate approximately 50% of their diet was composed of uh, cultigens, uh, which compared to autumn was, they estimated 60%, so very much, very close to the level the autumn were doing historically. Um, but then also you have to understand the autumn were also involved in a cash economy historically with their agriculture. So they're 
there was an incentive perhaps for them to grow a little bit more. But what I'm getting at is these folks were farming on par with the odds and people historically. Now in terms of where they mobile, if you read the uh, ethnographies, uh, they weren't mobile. You hear about folks moving from the floodplain to the highland during the flood season. Depending on where that, were, that was, that could be a football field to a mile. On the Colorado River, it was much further because of a much larger floodplain. On the lower Gila River, a football field, maybe not even, which is something we're starting to learn about this area. And so the concept of using historic tribes to talk about prehistoric things, archaeology, um, I'll just defer, this is Colton's quote here. So in the Southwest, there's been this tradition of sort of studying prehistory separate from history. Right? There's at 1450 something radical happened and people moved or they disappeared or, or, or faded away. That's the popular narrative that we're, we've all been taught. And then of course there's something strange that happened archeologically, but in the Pataian world that didn't happen. Okay, we've got Colton basically saying that, but also we go back to Malcolm Rogers and he looked at this stuff probably more comprehensively than anybody. He argued that Pataian was unchanged from 1000 to 1900. So throughout, there is not a disjunction. The Spanish incursion into the Southwest didn't affect these folks directly until the late 1700s. So that was after 150 years of, uh, well, 100 years of, of contact and description. So the ethnographic picture is probably very much like <coughs> the prehistoric or the archeological picture. So I want to look at the ethno history of the lower Gila River. And so this is, uh, this is Kino's map, Teatro de los Trabajos Apostolicos, uh, drawn in 1695-96. It was actually drawn before he uh, visited the lower Gila River. And so what I've, I've zoomed in here is the lower Gila stretch where he mapped all these different villages. And these are villages, not seasonal hunter-gatherer camps, mind you. And then he attributes them to the Coco Maricopas and the Opas, who we know today as Peeposh. They refer to themselves as Peeposh. These are Aotam names for the Peeposh and the Peeposh villages along the lower Gila and the lower Colorado River. And the Colorado River here is that Rio del T zone. So this map was drawn before Kino knew that California was a peninsula and not uh, an island. So what I'm showing here, and you don't need to get into the nitty gritty, Kino came through in 1699, 1700. He came back in 1700. This fellow named Jacob Settlemeyer came through four times, maybe five times, in the mid 1700s. And then the Anza people, Gar says Anza font, they came through four times in the late 1770s. And they described the villages, not all of them, but periodically in their journals. They say, I visited this village and they had so many people, etc. And what I'm trying to get at here is the ones I've highlighted in yellow have the same name from 1695 to the late 1700s, so almost 100 years. And the fact that they have the same names suggests that those are villages that lasted that long in those places. So these are communities, Peeposh communities, that lasted for at least a century, the ones that are highlighted mostly. And uh, several of these were actually described by Mexican explorers that I, I don't show on here. And the Mexicans, the journals of the Mexicans, the Romero expedition, 1823, he referred to several of these as capitals. And these were nations of people. And if we look at the demographics that the Spaniards described, we're talking about villages of dozens of people to hundreds of people and with total estimates for the lower Gila around two to 3,000 people. So this is not a light footprint of mobile hunter-gatherer peoples visiting uh, the Gila River on a seasonal basis as what's being filtered into the literature currently. So that was the first myth. The other myth is the myth of site preservation. So working in this western area I've been told by many people that the sites are no longer there. They're in the floodplain, they've eroded out, they've been plowed. Um, 
Some of them have, obviously, a lot of them have probably, but I was talking with Michael Harner, who was a battalion archeologist, passed away last year. And in the 1950s, he did a lot of work on the Colorado River, and he was collecting, doing surface collections on agricultural fields along the Colorado River of large Mojave, ancestral Mojave villages. So they were not necessarily flooded away. Some of them were obviously plowed over. A lot of others were inundated by the reservoirs that have been built, especially in the, in the Gila Bend area, the Painted Rock Reservoir. So I'm currently working on this project that I've called the Lower Gila Ethnographic and Archaeological Project, where I'm looking at the ethno-history and the archaeology to really better understand this area. And this is my project area, and it basically stretches from the Painted Rock Mountains to Agua Caliente, if you're familiar with this area. And the reason I chose this is because uh, the ethnohistoric records show dense habitation in this area by Peeposh people up until the 1830s. It's also west of the Painted Rock Reservoir. The Painted Rock Reservoir inundated and destroyed, we believe, and destroyed a number of uh, Batayan and ancestral Peeposh sites. And that being because these communities, these villages, did live really close to the river. If we look at Hoakam villages, they tend to be up several terraces away from the river because of the canals. They had to bring the canals up onto high ground to keep them preserved, and so their villages were close to canals. Historic human-speaking tribes that were farming the Colorado and the Gila River didn't use canals per se, they did floodwater farming, so they resided much closer to the river and often on the first bench above the floodplain. So in events where you do have floods, there's a lot of erosion. So I want to give one case in point, one example of the work that we've done out there and some, some of the exciting finds. This is a reconstruction of the villages that Kino described in 1699-1700. And also his companion, Monhe. Uh, we've used both of their accounts to approximate the locations of these villages based on their relationship to each other, and they gave distances in leagues, but uh, so it's not a... A league is different depending on what time period. Uh, and some of these are probably closer to approximate than others, but I've conferred with Harry Winters, who's uh, done some work with this stuff as well, and I want to focus on this San Tadeo de Baki near Oatman Mountain. Now that's a village that Kino wrote and he described, and it's in the, we're certain it's in the western part of the Paint, what's Painter Rock Valley or the Dindora Valley. And we would presume it would be next to the river, because that's where these habitations were. And so if we actually look at that location on the ground today, this is what we find. What I've, what I've highlighted in red is what I believe is that village. And it is on a preserved piece of river terrace directly above the floodplain. So that bottom third of the photograph is the dry Gila floodplain. And what we have, we have an area of the, flood, of the terrace that hasn't been plowed. So it's starting, the more work we do out there, we're learning that the farmers didn't plow often up all the way to the floodplain because it's probably to preserve their fields from erosion. And so wherever we're finding these preserved segments of the Gila River bench right next to the floodplain, we're finding these village, well, I'm interpreting them as villages. I'm going to call them villages. And this is this kind of ceramics I found at this. In profile, these are four select rim sherds. And what's exciting about this is they all have this attribute of a coil around the rim. And we know by excavations in California and here in southern Arizona that that attribute of a rim coil is proto-historic, early historic. And my colleague Jerry Schaefer in California believes it's late 1600s. So it was in, we're not really sure why it was introduced or adopted but it is a telltale temporal marker, one of the few that we have for the pottery out in this region. And so this site, because it has that pottery on there, I'm pretty convinced that it dates to conservatively the late 1600s, possibly into the, early, into the late 1500s. So that goes really well with the information that Kino provided. So this is an example of using these old ethnohistoric records to identify archaeological sites, then also to put those archaeological sites into a temporal context, which has been really challenging for Pataian archaeology. And here's another example. Here's a, we have a preserved section of the river terrace that's tucked into, a, uh, into the side of the lava flow. 
And in this photograph, you might see faintly there are three trails that go from the, that terrace onto the mesa top. Uh, and then those link up with, with a major trail on top of that mesa that went to, uh, from Ago Caliente all the way to Kamaki on the Gila River near, uh, near Levine. And what we found on this site, so we have no indication to think that this is a proto-historic site. Kino and Monje and those folks didn't drop down into this area as far as we know, but what we found were a few slotto polychromes. So this is implying, now this site, we inventoried over a thousand ceramics. This is not a ceramic scatter. This is a very intensively occupied area of the river. And we found slotto polychromes, which says, okay, so this pattern of living alongside the river right above how the floodplain goes back to 1300s, maybe the late 1200s. So now we have some time period. We just can't say this is a proto-historic phenomenon. And I don't have a slide for it because I don't want to spoil it, but we're finding actually other sites like this that are on the order of 10 to 20 times as large that have snake town phase ceramics on them from the whole calm period. But they're predominantly lower Colorado buffware period ceramics. So you'll have an assemblage that's 95% lower Colorado buffware, which is a, a tie-in technology with a small amount of Hohokam intrusives. And that snake town phase, that's early. That's very early. And so what's that, what's that telling me is you actually have a very large Pataian component on the lower Gila River that's been overlooked early. And it really counters that Rogers model of these folks moved in after 1200, after 1300, once the Hohokam allegedly fled the area. It appears we've known from excavations now since Rogers' time, actually as early as the 1960s, that by 1050, Pataian or folks using uh, that lower Colorado buffware pottery were living in the Gila Bend area alongside these whole calm villages. So they were contemporaneous. And we know that by 1250, that at some point in time, they were living in the same villages. So what it's looking like is by 8800, we have sizable Pataian communities, I call them villages, uh, living west of the Painted Rock Mountains at the same time you have the whole calm villages taking root in the Gila Bend area. So this is actually before Gatlin. This is contemporaneous with the Rock Ball Court site, which is the westernmost Hohokam Ball Court site, which is about 20 miles east of here. So uh, this work is starting to change our conception of Pataian, and I would like to think that it's really adding this as a fuller component of the, of the anthropology and the archaeology of the Southwest, and I think it's exciting times. And I'm happy to take questions at this point, or criticisms if they may be, if anybody has any. Aaron, um, I'm interested in that, uh, the site where the Salado polychromes mm -hmm. were found. Is that a kind of an isolated thing, or was yeah. it more, um, or is it a kind of a regional, or any ideas on? The site, is uh, it isolated, or is the, the idea of having Salado polychromes on these sites isolated? What's the question exactly? Oh. Well, I was kind of interested if that was unusual, I mean, a, a very isolated find, or have you found them in other sites, and did they seem somehow no. like those sites were related? Or It's really uncommon to find slotted polychromes as far west. This is the first and only site I've seen with slotted polychromes out here. I've seen them on trails, so we know they're moving. They've been found in excavations um, on the Barry Goldwater Range. And one was reported from the Painted Rock Petroglyph site back in 1929. But no, they're really uncommon. But what's useful is they, we know the date on them. So we can date sites when we find them. And so the Hohokam intrusive shirts and the intrusive slotto ceramics, and we actually have Puebloan ceramics out here too. When we find them, it really helps us put those sites into a temporal frame. So no, it's not common. I don't want to give the impression that slotto's out here. Not, not in the least. So Aaron, did you find any habitation sites on the mesa tops or were they all down in the river valleys? It's a great question, Doug. No, I've not seen any habitation sites on the mesas, which really fits into this, um, this hypothesis of the floodplain farming. 
So from the, on the Colorado River, people needed to get up out of the river floodplain during the flood season. So they, again, I have a problem with that word mobile. They were moving from a high, high ground, which wasn't that far away, into the floodplain and farming, then moving back to their main village. And they were staying in those places for a long time. Now on the lower Gila River, you would expect during the floodplain, flood time, people would move up onto the mesas. Very similar to what they're doing on the Colorado River. We find no evidence of that. There's no evidence of, of habitation. There's along the mesa edges. You could say, well, they're moving far into the interior. I've read that in the literature that the, these, these um, seasonal habitations on the lower Gila was from people 20, 30, 40 miles away, moving from caves in the Papagoria and living on the Gila. And um, we'd have to work that out. We'd have to, you know, there are ways we can test that. That seems like a stretch. Um, there's not really any reason to leave the Gila that far. Uh, it's a perennial, it was a perennial river at the time. What I, in Castetter and Bell and their human Indian agriculture, they talk about the lower Gila River flood dynamics as not being as severe as the Colorado. And so the Peeposh that were living out there didn't do that. They didn't have that pattern of living in, a, in the floodplain and then consolidating at a larger village during the flood season. There are descriptions of Peeposh residences in the floodplain though. So presumably they were moving in and out of the floodplain. But the Gila's flood dynamics were not the same as the Colorado's. The Gila had a much, uh, the way they describe it, a much more gradual uh, flow, and that the floods were not as catastrophic as they were on the Colorado. Did I answer your question? Well, yeah, well, we can, we have a possible site on a mesa top, and we can send you a UTM reading. Take me to it. Up in New River, uh, almost all the mesa tops have like a fortification area on it, but it seems like it was just a fortification area and not really a village. Mm -hmm. Was there any of that down there? Well, I showed you the Fortaleza. That was a Hoacom site. Uh, what it, I don't, there's not a consensus on if it was a village or a retreat. Now it was occupied, uh, definitely occupied. There's occupational refuse there. Uh, but the, there's not a consensus on whether it was permanently resided in. And then there are three others that we know of upstream from there. There's, um, well, there's the, the Fort Pier Point Canyon, which is not on a mesa, but it's in a, it's in a canyon that's uh, fortified. And then there's Powers Butte and Robbins Butte have what have been described as fortifications on top of them. But I've been to both of those, and those are probably more similar to what you're describing. There's very little residue artifact wise to indicate any sort of serious or long-term habitation and they were i would consider them more of a retreat and because there were villages right below them in the floodplain and right up above the floodplain so a very similar phenomena and they all date to the late 1200s and it fits that pattern of there is something going on on the western frontier of what had been the hoacom world um, but to insinuate that that's because of aggressive human incursion that some of these older scholars had written about, I think is no longer appropriate uh, because we know that they were in the area for centuries before then in a apparently a peaceful collaborative arrangement. Uh, regarding the petroglyphs, yeah. what are the distinctive characteristics that compare and contrast to Hohokam? How would you distinguish Patayan art, rock art? That's, a, that's good. Well, Patayan petroglyphs and pictographs it covers, it includes a lot of things. Because um, we're, again, that's a, a broad concept, Patayan. So we're talking from San Diego, there's the San Bernardo pictograph style over there, which is very distinctive. Um, then you have a Kumie pictograph style, which has humanoid figures with really big hands. But those are pictographs. Those happen in Southern California, Northern Baja. On the lower Gila River, you get the Sears Point style, which is, um, it's hard to describe, at least the geometrics are. They're very, the geometrics are very different often from Hoacom. And so if you're working with, from a Hoacom framework, it's very difficult to put them into categories. But the, the Sears Point style has been described as being a lot more figurative. So many, much more of 
animals and human and lizard figures portrayed. And the humanoid figures and um, sometimes have the really big hands and feet. So the big hands and feet is considered a hallmark of Pataian petroglyphs and pictographs, although it doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, and then at the painted rock site, the painted rock site is, is problematic um, from a research perspective because it, it looks like Hohokam, kind of, but it has these Pataian elements as well. And um, the site's been described as, as a Hohokam petroglyph site, but when we studied that site and we counted up all the ceramics that were there, 175 ceramics, 95% of them were Pataian ceramics. So I think the question really gets at the relationship between these Pataian communities and the Hohokam communities at the same time. And through time, the petroglyph styles changed. And I, I believe during when the Hohokam fluorescence was occurring, so 800 to say 1100, uh, it appears that um, the Pataian communities were heavily involved economically with them because of the shell that we're finding on these Pataian villages. Uh, but then also in the, in the petroglyphs, they look really similar. Um, but then there's that Great Va Grapevine Canyon style that I mentioned, and that's totally unique. And it's found, the only places I've seen it is at Grapevine Canyon, and I've seen it in the Eagle Tail Mountains with Doug Newton. So, um, Great Vine Canyon it historically was a location of Mojave, so it was a Mojave area. Um, and we know that the Mojave would go to the Eagle Tail Mountains uh, to collect crystals, and they had a lot of interaction with the Peeposh near the Gillespie Dam area and then in Gila Bend. And so the Eagle Tail Mountains were a sort of midway point, so that explains why you would have that grapevine style in the Eagle Tails as well. But maybe I made that a little too more complicated. But it's a complicated subject. Um, Aaron, I yes. have a question from Facebook. Yes. Um, simple question, what is the largest estimated settlement in the area by population? Uh, well, I can't answer the estimate on populations for the prehistoric components. Um, None of these, well, very few of these sites have been excavated. None of them have been excavated since 1960 uh, when the Painted Rock Reservoir uh, excavations were going on. And they actually, you'll hear, sometimes you'll hear people say that they've never found a Pataian house. That's not true. That was, two of them were dug in 1960. Um, so archaeologically, we really lack on our information of what these sites look like in an excavated context because none of them have really been excavated. Uh, but historically, uh, the larger villages that the Spaniards encountered, for example, I believe the village at, at, um, at he, near Gila Bend, uh, the Upark, uh, you know, Upark village, had several hundred residents in that one community. Uh, and then the other village, or what the Mexicans called was a capital at Agua Caliente, had an equivalent number, two to 300 residents. Uh, but again, those estimates, we don't know what those are. They describe those communities being composed mostly of men. And so uh, women and children are probably being hidden um, from the Spaniards as they came through. So those might be double. We might be looking at villages of five to 600 people um, in select spots with continuous, fairly continuous habitation between them. And then all the way up to the Salt Gila confluence. So again, the Spaniards estimated 2,000 souls, Anza's team did. Um, that's probably a fair, fair estimate, which is actually more than the amount of people living in that area today. Um, did, you, did you find uh, sites on stabilized sand dunes? Yes, that's what I'm finding. Along the, along the Gila River floodplain, those first benches are essentially stabilized silt dunes. Oh. Sometimes they're sand dunes. Right. And more often, they're silt dunes. And it's, I have a pattern that's starting to emerge, I think, where it's probably a temporal pattern, where the sand dunes are, are from a certain period and the silt dunes are from another. The silt dunes are much larger um, in terms of the landform. The sand dunes are uh, more isolated phenomena, and they appear to have the more recent pottery on them. Um, but so in, in the context of the previous question, 
there is a preserved sand dune site that's approximately 20 acres in size. So, and that's one that has the Snake Town pottery on it. So the early ones are big. The later ones seem to be a little smaller. So 25 acre, 20, 25 acres site, the population of that, um, that's a lot larger than many Ho'okam villages. So, so did, you, did you find any sites that you would identify as archaic sites? There are archaic sites out there, yeah. I've, I've found one campsite, I guess, um, small thing with some projectile points, and then the petroglyphs are the most predominant archaic element out there. And there are a number of archaic petroglyph sites. Generally, the archaic petroglyph sites also have Pataian petroglyphs with them, but it's not the reverse. Off, more often than not, the Pataian petroglyphs are at places where there weren't existing petroglyphs. But wherever you have an archaic petroglyph, there's Pataian petroglyphs with them. So do you think that the archaic sites are on, are on stabilized sand dunes also? They're not on them because I'm not seeing them. They might be in right. them. Right. <laughs> they might be in them, yeah. Is it just my occasional observation, or is there anything that would prove up that when you see petroglyphs, the images of the individuals, people or animals are moving from right to left? I mean, you don't often see anything moving from left to right. I've never, I've never looked at that analytically, but when you mention that, I, I, I get that same impression, but I, I instantly think of a site that we've recorded in the past couple months where it's actually the other way, it's left to right. Um, so you might be onto a pattern, absolutely, now that I think about it, but uh, it's something we can actually look at pretty easily, so thanks for the idea. I might be able to answer that soon. <laughs> So Aaron, um, Archaeology Southwest focuses on preservation archaeology using low impact methods. Could you describe how you're going about uh, recording these sites in the field? And you're able to make some pretty um, firm uh, inferences from the kinds of information that you're gathering. Maybe just sharing that a little bit more with, with the audience here. Yeah, absolutely. So we're doing surface documentation. We're not doing any excavation. Uh, if we excavated these sites, we probably wouldn't learn much more than we know from the surface. These sites, the ones that have been excavated, so those ones in 1960, they were only 20 to 30 centimeters deep. So these, these are really surface phenomena sites on silt dunes and sand dunes that erode. And so the stratigraphy that you get with depth doesn't really exist. So um, considering that, uh, we are doing everything surface based. Uh, there are limitations to that. So we have the early stuff is mixed with the more recent stuff and that complicates things. Um, it's a very difficult puzzle to work out. But as Bill mentioned, we're able to find more information than we had. So we are revisiting some of these sites, looking at this area 50 years since it has been. We have new information about ceramic types. We have new survey methodologies. Uh, statistical sampling procedures that we can really extract more information out of and make some concrete statements of. Now the petroglyphs, you don't need to excavate those. Um, they're right there. So uh, we're learning a lot about the petroglyphs through non-invasive procedures as much as we can. Um, so that it, I have another good question from right. Facebook, if you're ready for it. Right. <laughs> we got some good people on Facebook tonight. It's great. Um, he asks, is there any interest in the agricultural stature and understanding of hydrology, specifically building or flood irrigation systems, retention of storm flows, distribution of water, just, you know, from direct co crops? So questions about how, how are they irrigating and farming, basically? Well, if there's a geohydrologist that wants to come out <laughs> and, and help me, I would love it. Um, as far as I can find, there is not a comprehensive geohydrological study of the lower Gila River west of Gila Bend. Um, so we, that needs to be done. Uh, so I am, there is an interest in that. Uh, presumably, these communities were floodwater farming. What that means is the floodwaters rise, and as they retreat, uh, people go in, they plant their crops in the moist soil, and those crops propagate, and before the next flood, they have a crop, they pick it, et cetera. Uh, 
And based on the ethnographic information, they were also using diversion dams and little ditches in certain areas in the floodplain. So we don't have those things preserved. So that's, that's speculative archeologically informed through ethno history. Uh, but beyond that, that's our best guess. These sites haven't been excavated, so no one's bothered to do any sort of pollen or phytolith analyses on the ground stone or any of the bell-shaped features that might show up off these sites. So in a nutshell, there's a whole realm of research that hasn't been done on these sites to understand the agricultural potential and the practice and the history of this region. But if we simply look at the size of these villages, so those early, one of these early ones being 20 to 25 acres in size, where they're located, um, I think it's a good inference, I guess you could say it's a hypothesis waiting to be tested, that uh, folks were farming not as a hobby, but probably as a lifestyle by the 800s along the lower Gila River. I was just wondering if you know, if you have any understanding of what the climate was like back in 1500 or, or one, even 1000, 1200. It was probably very similar to what it was today. And so um, climatically during the, uh, during the time that we're talking Pythian, proto-history, proto um, the Peeposh era, uh, very much the same as it is today. So you had the, the medieval warm period and then the Little Ice Age. Those are these two larger climatic phenomena that Southwestern archeologists talk about because they happen at these times when you have radical uh, socio-cultural changes in the archeological record. Middle of a warm period, it gets a little warmer, it gets a little wetter up on the Colorado Plateau. We don't really know how that affected Southwest Arizona. Um, I don't think anyone's really looked at that yet. Uh, but then you have the midi of a warm period which comes in, which is a 300 year period of heating and cooling. It wasn't just warm or cold, it went up and down. And oddly enough, um, that coincide, the onset of that coincides with some pretty radical um, hydrological changes in the, in the area that I don't think has been fully understood. But I've also been working at this site, not on the Gila River, but up near Parker, um, the Bouse Well site. And that site is a long time Pataian habitation site around a walk-in well. And it was in use from the 700s to about 1450, 1440. Uh, based on some new radiocarbon dates that we have. And um, they're using the groundwater to support themselves uh, for, what is that, 600 years, 700 years. And so they give up right about the time of the onset of the Little Ice Age. So I'm wondering if that had something to affect the groundwater supply, because they clearly went down so far and they just gave up on it. So I don't know. long answer to your question. Archaeology magazine said that using LIDAR, they're developing a, a way to detect ancient routes, even footpaths and ways of trading. And the death masks in Mayan culture, some of them were made with turquoise from Nevada and New Mexico. So did these people interact with people far away on their trading? Most definitely, yeah. So we have evidence of that, not in the form of Mayan death masks or anything yet, um, but there's definitely a very major route of travel along the Gila River that has branches that come off of it that have been mapped historically, but then archeologically we see them. Um, they're pretty visible on the ground surface out here because of the topographic setting, the basalt lava fields. You can actually see the footprints and they are littered some of them are littered in pottery sherds. And when you look at those pottery sherds, they range from, we found recently a Chaco era area uh, as a red mesa, black on white. So an early Chaco in ceramic out here. So very far. Um, now that could have been traded, sure, but we know it was on one of these major routes of travel. And there are ethnographic uh, stories and records of people as far away as Zuni being visited by Spaniards at Yuma. And, um, and then Zuni's going into Mexico, et cetera, on the, you know, not near the lower Gila River, but going due south. So yes, the lower Gila River factored into very large, long range, extensive trade networks. You see it most predominantly with the shell. And so some of these Pataian 
sites that we have, the larger ones, are covered in worked shell. So they're definitely involved in the shell economy that seems to have been driven by the demand in the Phoenix Basin for shell jewelry. So they're tied into that somehow. Um, so Mesoamerica, not yet. When I find that death mask, I'll come <laughs> back and... <laughs> Gwen Vivian, when he did a survey in 65, he found a site that he said he collected four pieces of trincheras pottery. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it was a site in Dendora Valley somewhere. Yeah. Did, I mean, I know that would be pretty hard to find, find something like that. Uh, he found, I was reading that report the other day again, actually. He found uh, the trench errors, uh, uh up there right near the dam. And that site, you've been there. It's, uh, it has a Hohokam platform mound on it, or not platform, trash mound on it. So that's a, that's a Hohokam, uh, definitely a Hohokam site. Uh, so finding the trencheras on it isn't too surprising to me. It's because the trencheras at that time. So it's also an early classic period site, which is when the trencheras thing was really kicking off. So it's pretty far away, but it's within the realm of not too hard to understand, I think. That site also had the Tanky Verde. He calls it Tanky Verde, red on, bu red on buff or red on brown. So. Um, which the, the relationship the twank, tanky verde, red on brown, um, and trencheras decorated pottery is pretty similar. And so I, having not seen those sherds yet, they're in the collection at the ASM. I'm going to go and look at those collections. Having not seen them yet, I wonder if they might actually be tanky verde, because you do get some tanky verde uh, red on brown that looks like purple on red. So. Well, I think, I hope you got the impression tonight, A, that Patayan can be a little bit confusing if you go back and wallow in all what previous archaeologists have said, but that this kind of actual work on the ground, which has been long time coming, is actually starting to reveal incredible new insights into Patayan along these riverine zones, and Aaron will eventually uh, pull it all together on, on the, the large scale, but uh, he's, he's, he's young. Um, and. <laughs> We'll probably have him back many more times in the future. So thank you, Aaron. Uh, can we all give him a hand? Thank you.